experience with reef tank pests and nuisance algaes and how I got rid of them. I'm gonna relive some of my, you know, reef tank trauma here today. Reef tank pests, nuisance algaes, it's not a matter of if you will get them. It's a matter of when you will get them. And I have to admit, going through these pests and algaes myself, I was freaked out about to give up and pack in the whole hobby, but it's not that bad. And hopefully this video, you can learn that they're not that bad when you do encounter them. So let's get to it. Oh, and also one of these, I actually paid good money to add as a pest into my tank. So stay tuned for that one. Let's get to it. So the first on my list is nasty alien looking algae. That's not really an algae, but it kind of resembles an algae. I had just started reef tank keeping. I had just set up this cute little 29 gallon bio cube and I was so happy. I was like, oh, everything was going so smoothly. I had encountered no problems up to this point. I was just like, Psh, reef tanks are hard, like get out out of here like I'm doing so good and then and then I woke up to this <laughs> happen by the time I woke up. That, my friends, is red slime algae, aka also better known as cyanobacteria. And although it takes over really quickly in your tank and looks like some scary, I don't even know what, like alien looking slime, it's really not that difficult to deal with it and nothing to be afraid of if you ever get it in your tank. It usually comes about because of one of three things. One, high nitrates and phosphates. And this pretty much applies to all algaes, but high nitrates and phosphates, lack of sufficient water flow going through your tank, like your power heads are struggling, there's some dead zones, you know what I mean? That's when you can see red slime algae pop up. Having like your lights on too, too long in general, like having like a really long light period is where you'll start seeing these nasty algaes. Luckily at the time, it was really easy to get rid of just through manual removing, uh, using my little water siphon thing during a water change. I managed to siphon all of it up, do more water changes those next few weeks, which turned out that the problem was gone and it was good. But since I've had it in the more recent years, since that first defining event, I have used ChemiClean treatment, which is really straightforward and easy to use. However, I do warn that you do not use it when you have just recently added corals to your tank. It was a mistake I made and my 40 gallon later, a few years later down the road where I had just introduced a beautiful trachea and unfortunately I didn't even think about it because ChemiClean is, was relatively safe when I used it in the past. I mean, I had no issues and it ended up killing beautiful brand new trachea. So definitely don't do that. Otherwise, if you, if all of your corals have been in your tank for a little minute, then you should be good. ChemiClean isn't particularly harmful to corals or anything, you know, but make sure like every algae, if you ever encounter counter it, that you're understanding why it even showed up in your tank to begin with. I think that's the most important thing when you're facing any kind of nuisance algae in your tank is why, why did it happen? Because if it will happen again, figure out why you're experiencing high nutrients and resolve it so it doesn't happen again because it'll keep happening again. And I don't want y'all to leave the hobby because you're getting frustrated with these nuisance algae, you know what I'm saying? The next algae that I dealt with uh, starting out in this hobby, I was still relatively fresh. I think I'd just been in the hobby for one year at this point. Still things were going really smoothly and I was like, I know my stuff. And then I got this algae. <laughs> I didn't even know how to approach this. I ended up having to face a big, long battle with this particular algae for years, just because whenever I took pictures, whenever I showed a video, I consulted Facebook forums. I asked around like at my local fish store at the time. I was like, what is this algae and why can I not get rid of it? At this point, I had just tried like manual removal and doing more water changes, just hoping for the best really, but it was just 
progressively worse. Nothing was helping. Why? Because whenever I would receive help from the fish store, from the internet, everybody assumed it was green hair algae. Nothing trumps this one. Because this was not green hair algae. This was bryopsis. Bryopsis is a whole different beast than green hair algae. You're looking at two totally different ways of managing this algae and getting rid of it. Bryopsis comes to be in your tank for the same kinds of reasons that algaes generally come into your tank to begin with. Like I mentioned earlier, high nutrients, too much light. With green hair algae, you're looking at longer, more grass-like. What is this? grass-like algae that's longer. And in that circumstance, you can actually hand remove a lot of it yourself, like kind of just peel it off the rock. There are fish options too. A lawnmower blenny, those work great at tackling hair algae. And these are all things that I tried thinking for so many months, like over a year thinking that I had green hair algae. I attempted all of this and nothing made a dent because it turned out to be bryopsis. Bryopsis, although it looks looks like green hair algae. It's kind of similar. It looks like grassy kind of. It's a lot shorter at the base next to where it attaches on the rock. So you can't actually peel it off and like get rid of it manually like you can with green hair algae. But they look so similar like people are going to give you the wrong advice. If you notice that when you try to peel it off the rock, there's it's very short and dense next to the base where it was attached, even if it had grown long and fluffy. Like if you try to peel off the long and fluffy part, it's got a really dense, thick layer on your actual rock, if that makes sense. For me, I got rid of bryopsis in the least ideal way. It took me a year and a half, close to two years, of just water changes alone. I practically starved my fish out. I mean, it was just really hard time for my tank because I was essentially trying to lower the nutrients so much in the only way I knew how. Knowing now, it's actually fairly easy to get rid of bryopsis using fluconazole. Fluconazole is just another medication, another treatment that you can apply, and it's actually an antifungal medication, but it will get rid of your bryopsis really easily and is really the only way that I would recommend getting rid of it. Definitely one of the most awful experiences I've ever had, but I'm grateful that it happened in a sick sense because it really tested my commitment to the hobby early on. It was suffocating my corals. It really took out the joy of the hobby. I cried many of tears over my bryopsis. Now I know better. And if I were to get bryopsis again, it's not that bad. Definitely pay attention to where it's green hair algae or bryopsis because it makes a huge difference in how you can get rid of it. The next on my list is the beloved bubble algae. Now I've had bubble algae so many times and it's a pain every single time you have it, but it's not the end of the world. It's a pain to get rid of just because you have to be pretty committed to the cause. Now, there are two lines of thought when it comes to bubble algae. Some people like stick to their, you know, they say absolutely do not hand remove bubble algae. Like do not even look at that algae. Even think about touching it because the second you touch it and it bursts, spores are released all over your tank and your bubble algae problem will become so much worse. Now, the spores spreading if you pop it is correct. That does actually happen, but I, I am a strong proponent that bubble algae should be hand removed. It should be hand removed because the only alternative that's ever given out is really use an emerald crab, right? And emerald crabs with those claws, like they are clumsy. They pop bubble algae if they even touch it, first of all, because every time I've added an emerald crab, they're more interested in the fish food, okay, than eating bubble algae, but I digress. I personally like to just use a siphon for water changes and suck it up, suck it up and try to obviously not pop as many as I can, suctioning them up in my water change. And this is a good way to remove them, but you have to be diligent. Bubble algae is one of the more stubborn algaes that exist. So you have to have a bit of dedication to its removal, but I personally am not a fan of emerald crabs for removing bubble algae. Some people swear by them, but I think that I stand by hand removal actually. I stand by it. I think that if done correctly, you can put way more of a dent into your bubble algae removal than anything. But yes, bubble algae, do not recommend, have had it multiple times. You just gotta be consistent with removing it. 
The next on my list is vermited snails. Vermited snails are they're annoying to say the least and it's kind of brutal the way you have to remove them but it's not it's not you can get through this i promise so vermited snails you often pick them up from frags you can get them on your live rock and you know yeah just attached to a coral unfortunately vermited snails can be really annoying to deal with they will make your they will grow in your corals and they will make your corals close up because how they feed is they release this kind of web out of their little snail carcass shell thing. They'll release this slime and it'll kind of cover your coral and they just try to pick out any kind of food they can get from that that attaches on their sticky slime. It's it's gross, it's gross, they're gross. And that slime will make your corals close up. Oh, I have dealt with a colony of vermited snails. I had them show up in my hammer garden and they just took ownership of that entire hammer. The best way to get rid of them and the way I got rid of them is to take a pair of coral clippers, coral um, wires or whatever they're called. The coral, take it to the vermited snail, chop at its base, like right at its base, and then you'll see a puff of its body come out. And that's when you know you have successfully killed the vermited snail is when its carcass just releases this pfft. Yeah, it's a pretty nasty way to get rid of it. It's kind of rewarding killing them, not gonna lie, like, but in a vindictive way, you know? Anyway, watch out for its little body spewing its guts everywhere. And then after, make sure to super glue on top of that opening because I find that if you don't super glue, they just come back somehow because they are annoying. Do I dislike a vermited snail? Definitely do. Another option that I have never personally tried is bumblebee snails. Bumblebee snails will eat some vermited snails. Like, do kill off your other snails in your tank. That's why I've never personally tried them and I just did hand removal, but it's definitely an option if you want to add some bumblebee snails, they will eat your vermited snails like it's no tomorrow. Now, the next one is something that I've dealt with again for the second time as of recently. If you guys saw my earlier videos that I posted a few months ago, I talked about how I finally removed it and I'm so happy about that. I have dealt with some Aptasia in the past and Aptasia is not the worst pest there is. I mean, acro eating anything, which would much rather not deal with that. But Aptasia is incredibly annoying. An enemy that's filled with evil. There are some species that are more, have a tendency to replicate much faster and I've dealt with those too. You just gotta be diligent with them and have patience in your method of removing them. There are several ways to remove them though. You got options. So the first one I'd say is using um, any kind of manual tools. I can use stuff like Aptasia X or Aptasia F where you're injecting the anemone with this goo that kills it. Seems good in theory, but you have to be very gentle with how you approach this because I've found that personally, I'm a bit too clumsy in my application and it tended to spread it for me, but that's just because I'm incompetent. I'm sure like Aptasia X and stuff is like really good method of removal. And if you have a smaller controlled population that hasn't really gone over the place, like if you, if you spot one Aptasia in your tank, I would definitely go the Aptasia X route, get rid of it, quickly before it spreads. But if you're dealing with a spread of Aptasia throughout your entire tank, the approach is a little bit different. There, there, are also, there are also fish that can take care of Aptasia, but that's not always guaranteed. There's file fish and copper bands. Copper bands, good luck trying to find one. And if you find one, tell me first, because that copper band is mine. I've been wanting a copper band for forever. Like I said, not always granted, but they're just pretty fish in general, which is why I want one. But copper band will eat it. File fish will also supposedly eat them. I added a file fish in my tank to try to get rid of my Aptasia, did it eat a single Aptasia? No, no. So I'm, I don't know, I'm not really a fan of the file fish. I'm very disappointed. It had one job, but I digress. The best method, the only method that has truly worked for me in absolutely eradicating Aptasia is really unfortunate method if you have rasses, but Bergia nudibranx. Bergia nudibranx, they live to eat your Aptasia. It's beautiful. They will just chomp down in groups and they will just eat every single last Aptasia. They don't harm any of your corals besides the Aptasia. They're just like these little creatures that were born to live and eat Aptasia. 
Asia. They're beautiful, highly recommend. However, this approach will not work if you have wrasses because wrasses will eat them. Like it's nobody's business, which is incredibly unfortunate because wrasses are my favorite fish. I still haven't added any to the 220 just because I'm so scared of dealing with Aptasia again. Bergia nudie bran Bronx, nudies, whatever. Best way to remove Aptasia hands down, but you've got other options such as fish and Aptasia X if you so choose to deal with it. And last but not least, a pest that I have dealt with that I paid good money to add into my tank. A pest you didn't know was actually a pest until you pay for it to be into your tank. And that, my friends, is Anthelia. Anthelia is a coral that resembles uh, a pulsing Xenia, uh, except it doesn't pulse. This. Anthelia. If you decide to add it into your tank, it's going to grow incredibly fast. It's going to suffocate other corals. It's going to grow on top of everything. And if you add it into your tank, aside from like removing the rock completely and just starting over, you're always going to see Anthelia pop up back in your tank. And frankly, there's no cure for it. Just regular cutting down. I first added Anthelia into my biocube when I first started. I had no intention intention to introduce it into my following tank, which was an Innovative Marine 40 gallon. But my dear reef mama, she she took it upon herself to add that Anthelia into my 40 gallon and it just constant cycle of it growing, taking over me, having to cut it down and then it growing back. So if you ever add Anthelia into your tank and any other kind of really fast growing, crazy weed-like coral, think again, because sometimes like Anthelia Anthelia, even if you keep it on a separate rock, it's the type of coral that can replicate by just floating off into another section of your tank. <laughs> the best way to manage it, because really the only way you can deal with it is by managing it, is regularly taking a razor blade and just slicing the rock and the coral off of the rock. And yeah, it's, it's just gonna be a regular part of your maintenance. When you're thinking of adding Anthelia, make sure that you're ready to commit to it for life. <laughs> because I still ended up with some in the 220 Ellen. So it's like something that forever haunts me. I'll uh, never, never fully get rid of Anthelia. So the pests that I paid good money for, I guess. These are all of the reef tank pests and nuisance algaes that I have dealt with. They're really not that bad once you deal with them. At the time, seems like the most horrible thing to deal with, but I promise you it gets better. They are an expected part of this hobby and and that's why we love it. It keeps everything interesting, am I right? Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please comment below what videos you would like to see more of. I'm trying to come back posting on YouTube regularly. Until next time, uh, let me know what pest has been your worst you've ever dealt with. Hopefully I don't get that one too, <laughs> but I guess it's just a matter of time, right?